Hello and welcome to this CNBC Africa special broadcast of the GE Innovation Barometer Forum. I'm Wale Family. We're reaching you from um, the Intercontinental Hotel in Lagos, Nigeria. And we are talking innovation. Innovation indeed is changing our world. And that change is also coming to Africa. And we have a very distinguished panel to give us some insight into how partnerships and talent play a key role in driving innovation on the continent and especially in Nigeria. And joining me to give their perspective on innovation in Nigeria is Lazarus Angbazo. He's the president and CEO of, the, of GE Nigeria. Of course, GE has a rich history in innovation. I'll be hearing a lot more about that as we go along. Also in the panel today is Andrew Ali, the CEO of the Africa Finance Corporation. The Africa Finance Corporation is investing two and a half billion dollars on the African continent. Of course, focus on infrastructure. We'll be hearing a lot more about innovation and how that is playing a role in that process. We also have Sadiq Kazim, the general manager of the Calabar Free Trade Zone. He will be sharing a very interesting perspective on how the public sector is partnering with the private sector to drive innovation in Nigeria. And last but not least, of course, is Charles Inyagete. He's the CEO of the Nigeria Mortgage Refinance Company, about to really take off in Nigeria, the housing sector. We'll hear a lot more about how the NMRC is playing a key role in that respect. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, it's very interesting to talk about innovation in Africa and especially in Nigeria. Lazarus, I want to start with you. Of course, we know about the history and track record of GE in innovation. Your thoughts about the challenge of driving innovation in Nigeria right now, in your engagement with the public and private sector in Nigeria, your thoughts about how critical innovation is to, to making the changes we need in Nigeria right now. Thanks, Wally. I think, um, you know, the, the challenge really comes down to prioritization. I mean, I'm just reminded of a quote by uh, the new governor-elect of uh, Kaduna State who said that he and the president-elect should be pitied and prayed for because the challenges of Nigeria are so great, you know. And I think it's, um, it's sort of reflective of what we really need to do, right? I mean, if you think about the needs of the country, they're pretty obvious to everyone. Um, but how do we solve for those needs? It's really where the key challenge is, you know. And business as usual is not going to work it because we've been trying it for many, many decades. It's not working. Um, and it's not anything that is sort of uh, innovation in a lab. It's really about making the solutions that are proven all over the world to apply here in Nigeria, mm -hmm. whether it's in power or it's in oil and gas, in healthcare, in transportation, and, and in, in education, in, in um, supply chain, all of the things that this country needs. So the challenge, I think, for the new administration is with all of the ideas and the advice they're getting, all wonderful ideas, how do they focus and prioritize in the low-hanging fruits, and then kind of leverage the partnerships of companies like ours, companies like AFC, in order to pull together the solutions that will actually deliver for the Nigerian people. But well, Andrew, I want to get your thoughts about this. Your company obviously um, invests across the continent, so you have seen innovation at work to a large extent. Your perspective on how we deal with the big challenges we have with respect to infrastructure in this country. Yeah. Well, um, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. I think that um, when you have big challenges, the thing to do is to break them up into smaller challenges. The, the good news um, about, you know, if I can take one good thing about Africa and Nigeria being behind uh, many other places, <laughs> is that we actually don't even have to be too clever. We can just go to different geographies and pick models and ways of doing things uh, that have worked there, adapt them for what happens in Africa, and, you know, off you go. Um, and uh, I think that if you look at um, the whole process of innovation, and, and that applies to uh, innovation in, in things like the stuff GE makes and also innovation in services, you know, there's, uh, broadly speaking, product innovation, which is, you know, what it is you're making, and there's process innovation, uh, which is, you know, how you integrate that thing into a wider economy. Uh, if I can take Apple, you know, what they've done is a little bit of product innovation. Nothing that Apple actually sells is particularly unique, although obviously they tweak it and make it very nice. But it's how they integrate that into their processes. Uh, that makes Apple and, you know, how they have a whole seamless experience between product and processes 
software and hardware that gives um, uh, Apple such value. Now, if you try and translate that into, um, into what we do in Africa, how can we use technology uh, and uh, new ideas, both on the hardware and software, to um, change the game in terms of how we do things? Yeah. So take power, and I'll be quick here. One of the major bottlenecks in power is um, off-taker risk. So generally speaking, you've got a big power station, 150, 500 megawatts. Uh, the power from that is going to cost you 30, 50 million dollars per month, um, maybe even more in some cases. So there are very few entities that you know, are credit worthy to pay that for the power. The general utilities in most African countries are uh, not very bankable. So a lot of time and energy is spent on how do you credit enhance that. Now, is there some way between distributed power, between technology, that you actually spread out who is making those payments? Yeah. Because, you know, a million people paying, you know, $1 or $5 a month is a lot less of a credit problem than one person paying $5 million a month. Anything happens to that person, you're dead. Mm. You know, statistically, it's unlikely that all your one million people will not be able to pay in any given month. So if you can use, you know, distributed power to break the power up, if you can use e-payments to allow people to pay into a central point uh, where this cash is gathered, this is all really around combining the product. So the solar, for example, the battery technology, which will allow for uh, distributed generation with uh, processes and software around payments yeah. and around reaching people. So that's a sort of innovation to get around one of the major problems we see in Africa. Right. And there are many others like that. Right. We certainly talk more a, lot about, uh, a lot more about all of that, especially the role of technology in all of this. But Charles, I want to bring you into the conversation right now and just get your perspective on you know, what the NMRC is set to do and the innovation that is really underlying what the NMRC is trying to do in terms of tackling Nigeria's housing sector. Thank you. Uh, NMRC, I think I should just say, for those who may not quite understand what we are, we are a liquidity facility. Uh, and our role is primarily to make mortgages affordable. Uh, we find the key challenge in the industry is the mismatch of funding for housing provision. And that cuts across from the development right through to mortgages itself. Yeah. Uh, and so our role as NMRC is to be able to access funding in a more affordable manner and make that funding available to the mortgage providers, whether they are commercial banks or primary mortgage banks, as we call them in Nigeria. Actually, for NMRC, innovation is our first pillar is the first pillar of how we do business. Uh, we set out to actually transform the perception of how things should be done by saying that we are not looking at ourselves as an institution, we're looking at ourselves from a market perspective. And so NMRC is not so much building itself as an institution, but is mm -hmm. building the mortgage market. Yeah. And how are we doing this? We are building a portal, we're building an infrastructure base that would allow us to actually bring in all of the providers to a marketplace, so to speak. Markets have a way of better reflecting how you should do business. They create a competitive environment and they allow innovation to faster. Uh, unlike building an institution, if you sim simply build one institution, you lose all of those benefits of competition all of those benefits that a marketplace would bring. Uh, and so innovation for NMRC is key. And in innovating, we believe that would be the way to begin to deliver on the shortfall, it's about a 17 million shortfall in housing provision at the moment. And it's about just 0.2 of a percent of GDP uh, in terms of the mortgage. Uh, if we were to just crank that up slightly, yeah. it's 2% translates into trillion Naira business. So innovation in doing the practical things 
is the way we at NMRC see the way forward in housing provision. Right. I, I certainly hear about the opportunity in housing and what the NMRC can do in terms of the impact. We will definitely talk more about that. But well, Sadiq, let me just get your initial thoughts on innovation, especially within a free trade zone. You have, of course, very rich experience in that area in Nigeria. Your thoughts about the innovations that are, that are really enabled in a, a free trade zone? Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, for us, uh, the free trade zone, we operate um, a country within a country. So sometimes some of the regulations and rules are taken um, maybe in default. Um, I mean, we operate uh, our own sets of rules. Um, I think uh, with the coming of GE, because we happen to be the host for the two key um, footprints, uh, the manufacturing as well as the skills development. I think we immediately bought into it right from the onset uh, when GE was looking for a good site. Uh, uh, GE was trying to find an ideal location. We offered first and foremost the environment and then we also keyed into the innovation of giving the manufacturing uh, side uh, an, an environment that they could be able to do that and then also keyed into the um, skills development aspect. Um, I think what is left now is for us to really try first of all to get the cultural reorientation done. Um, secondly, I think we need to also put together the legal framework um, when you talk of innovation, I, I, I like to say GE has started quite a number of things. Um, others would want to follow, and I have heard um, the AFC uh, saying, yeah, people should leverage on the best practices elsewhere. But sometimes we miss the legal framework. Mm. And once that is lost, then we, we, we tend to get uh, back to square one or we, we, we go backwards again. So I think we need to, at this critical stage, ensure intellectual property rights, for instance, are protected. Yeah. Um, the rights of investors who put in money are protected so that they don't lose that money. I mean, if GE is uh, putting together a banking facility, or a banking arrangement, then those banks should not lose money also because of some recklessness of somebody. Yeah. I think we need to look at those things. Right, right. Um, let me hear from you again, Lazarus. I'm sure we'll have examples here. Yeah. How innovation, the impact of innovation, so you know, our viewers can really appreciate what innovation can do in a country like Nigeria. GE, of course, has a rich history there. Yeah. You know, let me talk about um, sort of the innovation in our business model in our partnerships, you know. Um, we are a big company, global footprint, global network. We've got a lot of power and capacity. But in a country like this, you cannot do it by yourself, right? right? And, and I think what we quickly discovered was that in order to actually sort of um, translate your success from around the world into an environment like this that is complex, complicated, you need to do it with credible partners. So we started with this whole umbrella concept of the country to company, and I love to talk about it because it really gives you a good framework for understanding this country, for building the sort of network that you need, and understanding things like the, the legal landscape that, um, that Sadiq was talking about, and working with credible institutions like AFC you know, and, and other agencies. So that, that model um, is one that has worked very well for us. And uh, we had not practiced it anywhere in the world, and we developed it here, and we've kind of continuing to mature and perfect it. But it's about not just the partnership with government. Obviously, government dominates a lot of what happens in this country. But we've learned a lot of lessons and then kind of cascaded it to private sector guys. Right. In this room, we've got a number of people right. you know, um, that we are partners with in the supply chain side. We've got a number of government agencies like the NSIA, you know, which is a funding aspect, a funding arm, but also really mandated to sort of find solutions for infrastructure gaps in the country. So, you know, we can kind of 
synergize each other and kind of bring the very best of what everybody around the table can do. So I think we should not underestimate the power of focusing on just developing the right partnership so that we can bring the very best capabilities that we all do. I think Andrew talked about it, you know, and, um, and it's something that I will continue to sort of promote and propagate and say, listen, we can't do it all by ourselves. So let's, let's find ways where we can kind of bring the very best of each other. Yeah. So it may not address your technical innovation question. Maybe I'll have another chance. But on this, on this area, I feel very passionate about and I think it's the way to go <laughs> because you cannot, you cannot do it by yourself. No, absolutely. But we'll still come back to, okay. to the practical impact of innovation. Yeah. But you've just made a very interesting point about partnerships. And I want to bring that to Andrew right now. Andrew, you invest across the continent. The value of partnerships, can you just speak to that point? Because very often what we find is that many people are not open to partnerships. You knock on the door and they're, they're not, they, they feel threatened, um, even to the, to the level of countries. They feel the company coming in may want to dominate. And so well, well, can you just speak to that point, your experience going across Africa, the value of partnerships in doing that? I think uh, it's, it's extremely important. Firstly, uh, we are an organization that operates pan-African. We have uh, investments in about 14 countries, literally all the way from Morocco up north down to South Africa in the south. So operating just out of Lagos as we do and trying to cover the whole continent is only possible by working with partners. Mm -hmm. um, the other point to make is that, again, when you're talking about infrastructure projects, which run to you know seven, several hundred uh, million dollars, maybe even more, billions, um, it's very hard for one person uh, to do this. But I think one thing about partners, or two things about partnerships um, that I would say that are very important. Firstly, uh, every party really needs to add some sort of value. Right. Um, and very often, uh, you know, people are talking about partnerships, but the value add is really, at least, you know, what they're thinking about is really only in a one way. Uh, direction um, and 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 you know I mean I guess you could call that in a way rent seeking <laughs> uh, but that is not really the basis of a partnership and unfortunately many things that are called partnerships are really more around that mm. the um, the other point about partnerships which in a way you alluded to is also that there has to be some sort of um, equality maybe isn't the right word but all partners have to feel um, that they're sort of similar in a way uh, and that there's no advantage. That's, that's more what I'm thinking about, that there's yeah. no advantage. So, for example, you know, I won't mention the country, but you know, we were negotiating a power purchase agreement in a particular country and um, you know, we weren't making much progress. And uh, eventually, we, did, we sort of figured out that um, we actually needed to get support for those guys. And, you know, they are partners because your power part purchase agreement yeah. is 20, 30 years. It's yeah. a partnership. And so we actually got um, USAID to uh, fund a consultant to work with these guys who would then negotiate against us yeah. in that power purchase agreement because we felt that really a fair power purchase agreement where people didn't think that one side had won in the negotiations is a lot more sustainable to build a longer term partnership. And I think yeah. that that worked uh, very well. And, you know, I mean, and then the fact that, you know, the US government was also supporting development of power is another area of partnership, which, you know, I won't go into at this Ooh, point, but right. I think it's very needed. We'll come back to this. Of course, we have to take a commercial break now. And when we come back, we'll continue our conversation around innovation and how we drive innovation with partnerships and with talent on the continent. Welcome back to the GE Innovation Barometer Forum over here in Lagos, Nigeria. I'm Wally Famriwa. We have been speaking about how we can drive innovation in Nigeria in particular through partnerships. And of course, we will be discussing talent management going forward. So let's now get your perspective, Charles, on this um, topic. Andrew was just making, I think, a very interesting point. In dealing with the infrastructure problems in Africa, you can't go it alone. The costs are, are, are prohibitive, if you like, if you go it alone. Now, you're about to embark on a, a dramatic change in Nigeria's housing sector. I want to get your thoughts about the, the value of partnerships in making, in making that move. 
of partnership is absolutely critical. Uh, as NMRC, we are a partnership itself. Uh, we, we are partnered between the public sector members and the private sector members. Uh, we're public-private partnership, so to speak. We have 22 investors in NMRC as we speak today, uh, two from the public sector, including the NSIA, who are represented here, and uh, the, the Ministry of Finance uh, investment arm, and 22, uh, 20 other financial institutions, including uh, mortgage banks as, and commercial banks. We also have waiting in the wings to invest in us uh, international partners, uh, the IFC and Shelter Freak, as well as several other uh, local financial institutions. So partnership is absolutely critical. And there is also the other side of it. There is an essence of innovating through partnership, even with competitors. That mm -hmm. sense is often lost uh, here. We, we sort of are conditioned to see uh, competitors as, uh, as adversaries and to lose out on the opportunity to collaborate in partnership to go forward. We see our role of extending this partnership to other segments of, of the economy. And so we are actually already in discussions with the insurance industry to bring them on board to help ease the challenges of, of affordability of mortgages. And so it would be possible to actually have 100% mortgages, part of which is supported by insurance cover for the, what would typically be the deposit element, because we see that as one of the challenges yeah. for people wanting to buy homes. Right. So a partnership is absolutely critical, and innovation through partnership is just as essential. So we epitomize, I would say, uh, the spirit of partnership. I would say Nigeria is gradually warming up to the idea of the NMRC, and I guess it will all be in the impact. So you've talked about partnerships. I want to hear from you. What, what should we expect? Uh, the innovation that we are seeing in terms of how the NMRC is constructed and the partnerships that it is forming, what can we expect from the NMRC, say, in the next one or two years? As we speak, uh, we are doing our roadshow. Uh, my CFO was here earlier. is actually out. We're doing our roadshow for our first bond issue. It's a 10 billion bond issue. And we're using the proceeds to refinance what we call legacy mortgages within the economy today. Mm. Uh, that is just the first in a series of, uh, of uh, issues, bond issues that we would be doing to raise funds. The partnership that I'm talking about really cuts across the entire industry. The developers need partnership to be able to provide housing to meet the massive shortfall. The mortgage banks need partnership to be able to refinance and have the extension of the tenor of their funding. And beyond that, we need to be able to take it to the market. And so what we're doing through the partnership that we, we have with the World Bank support of $250 million as our tier two capital, we're able to leverage on that. And we have a program during a sunset period backed by the government of Nigeria in terms of a, a government a guarantee for our bond issue to the tune of 440 billion during this sunset period. So that's significant in terms of addressing uh, what we're setting out to do. Right. We know that there are other institutions, and I'm hoping that the AFC would consider us uh, worthy <laughs> opportunities for investing. All we right. need partnership to move forward. And uh, I know that the African Development Bank is also showing interest. I just received an email a short while ago, mm. a 500 billion euro institution is asking to invest in our bonds before we've issued them. Wow. And that's the spirit of partnership and that's what we need going forward. So we're seeing the value of this partnership and Indeed. Andrew is doing that out to you. Indeed. Maybe we'll get a comment <laughs> Let's later talk. on that. Okay, but let me hear from you, Sadiq. Um, everyone has spoken about the value of partnerships. So you've been working in free trade zones across the country. I want to hear about your, your thoughts about this um, concept of partnerships in getting things done innovatively in Nigeria. Um, yeah, thank you very much again. Um, I want to still ride on G's back. Um, mm. We have operated a free trade zone concept in Nigeria for the last uh, 20 years. And when we look at the operations in Nigeria and compare it globally, 
we've never been mentioned at all in, as even a, a participant in the free trade zone activity. We're still practicing it. Dubai has come and gone way ahead. So when GE came, when we started this discussion with GE, how they would want to come and uh, invest as a, a manufacturing facility in Calabar, we felt this was a right move for us to also ride on their back yeah. um, on a partnership, uh, like it said, so that we can now go global. And by going global, I mean if any company uh, listed like GE sees GE in Calabar and uh, says, what's GE doing there? They, the next thing is they would want to come and find out what did they see in Calabar that they want to be there. So it was critical so, for you to make the GE deal happen. Exactly. So it, it's really important potential. for us to make it happen. Right. And that's what we're doing. Um, we want to really make sure that all things are uh, streamlined so that GE succeeds in this, and then we know we would be able to succeed. And I believe that uh, once that happens, others will now be coming. Uh, mm -hmm. GE suppliers would also look at it and say, oh, if GE is there, let's be closer to GE. Then the whole uh, free trade zone activity in Nigeria would actually see a new light. Right. And then there would be new attraction and people will start coming in. Um, the authority, Nigeria Export Processing Zones Authority, has also started looking at the same thing, mm. um, not just in Calabar, but in other free trade zones that are coming up, in other industrial clusters, industrial cities. Uh, these are all coming and the interest has gone and everybody is now saying, why don't we find a global player in the rank of GE to come and show interest in us so that we can do the same thing. All right. Andrew, I want to hear from you about talent. Um, you're in a specialized segment of infrastructure, of course. Uh, many people will say, given the challenge with infrastructure, it may be difficult to find the talent. What's been your experience finding talent to deal with Africa's infrastructure issues? Well, again, uh, it's always possible. Uh, with, um, uh, with in our sector, I think if you look at the talent and how you break it down, you know, there's a very technical aspect to these things. So, you know, what are the technical qualities of a road that you're building? You know, how do you engineer a particular structure to house, you know, a GE turbine uh, so that, you know, that thing can last for 20 years? Um, now, that kind of talent is frankly easily bought on a global market. Right. Um, and you can get the skills anywhere. Now, obviously, in the longer term, uh, we would like to develop those skills in an African, you know, we'd like those to be African skills. But in terms of moving things ahead, you can get skills, those kind of skills uh, everywhere. What is more difficult and more important is actually the um, entrepreneurship, the, you know, who is bringing that project, for example, who is developing that project? Who is, you know, who comes up with the idea of, oh, we want to build a power station here? Who's going to run around and get the power purchase agreement, uh, you know, negotiate with those tough guys called GE <laughs> uh, to, to get the equipment? Uh, you know, that kind of talent, the entrepreneurial talent, the managerial talent, the project development talent is actually something that is very important and somewhat lacking in Africa uh, in general and in Nigeria in particular. And, you know, it's not surprising. You know, we haven't had an open power sector. So nobody has been able to develop a power station in Nigeria until, you know, over the last few years. So it's hardly surprising that, you know, there are very few people who have done it. Um, but, you know, we in AFC have recognized this is a problem across Africa. And that's why we focus very much on project development. Uh, we have a small team of people in AFC who have that kind of experience. Uh, we have a pool of funds, and we use this to help develop projects. Uh, we did one in Ghana that closed in December. We've done one in Cape Verde. We're looking at a few, actually quite a few in Nigeria, and uh, to support the West Africa power pool in terms of power across the whole of West Africa. And, and, you know, hopefully as we do this, we're also building the local talent because what one organization can do 
um, no matter how fantastic uh, you may or may not be, is very limited. What you need to do is to build up a whole network right. of people who have these skills and, and talent. Right. Um, Charles, your thoughts on this? With, with regard to talent, I think we need to take a step back. Uh, in my, I've been fortunate to have served in, in institutions on three continents in my earlier career. Right. Uh, talent here, we tend to not train people to be able to express their talent. Uh, and uh, we used to talk in terms of useful learning. We are so focused on training them to earn certificates and not training them to liberate their minds to really be able to use the talent that they have. And so what we find and, and what it is required to be done is what is being done increasingly, is to bring pool of talent, whether they're Nigerians or from elsewhere, uh, to mix with the potential talent pool that there is here to allow them to see the aspect of using talent in doing. Yeah. Talent is not about having it and having it inert, yes. yes. But if you're not using it and not being entrepreneurial about your talent, not using it in innovative ways to, to bring solutions that, that make sense uh, to, to the industry, then that talent might as, not, uh, might as well not be there at all. Right. And so what we see in our case is to say, look, how has this sector been made to work in the past? How can we make it work better uh, through innovation, through drawing on the talent? Mm -hmm. And we find just within the Nigerian community, uh, albeit with, with support from those outside, a new set of talent who are addressing practical problems such as really being able to locate a property, uh, which is one of the big problems. We have multiplicities of uh, titles, titles and so on. Being able to locate a property precisely leveraging on technology and doing right. it so precisely that there's no way you can, you can mistake it one from the other. And this actually goes further. It allows you to be able to map transactions going forward to say, right, this particular property that is been mortgaged to bank B, is it not the same property that we're now seeing being mortgaged to bank A? And so because the systems are now being technology driven, we can easily isolate those sort of right. issues. And this is talent right. of a Nigerian bringing that aspect to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And were we not to be looking from a technology perspective, that talent would not have been utilized. So we need talent that comes out from doing not talent that is just there and can have a string of certificates to the name. That is not the kind of talent that we're looking for. The talent that does, the doing talent and the expression of the talent through doing. The barometer survey this year clearly shows that talent is a challenge in this country. You're obviously very optimistic about the type of talent we have here, but harnessing the, challenge, the talent is of course the bigger challenge. Yeah. So your experience in GE, how are you dealing with that? Well, number one, we are finding good talent, right? We are looking for them and we are actively recruiting them. But bringing talent in is just step number one. Number two, you've got to really develop them. I'll give you an example. For our Calabar project, we just hired uh, about 40 young engineers going through all of the screening processes of GE. So they are qualified from an entry position in terms of capabilities, intellect and everything, willingness to work, integrity and all of that. But we've sent them out you know, to our production centers in Aberdeen, in Brazil, all of these places, to acquire the sort of skills that they need for the roles that we're intending for them. Yeah. So you've got to do that, right, in terms of really getting the very best. In the end, GE does all of these wonderful machines, but it is a people business, sure. and it is all about our employees, and our employees are key to sort of delivering for our customers, delivering for our partners, delivering for the governments and the communities that we're operating. So I think uh, with the population that we have, I think Charles is absolutely right. We are producing a lot of paper degrees, but companies that are really committed to this community really have to sort of invest in individual development plans, such as we have, sure. when we bring people in, and managers are sort of tasked and measured you know, in terms of the commitment and the amount of effort they put in, making sure that our employees are getting the continuing education. I'm getting continuing education all the time, you know, and all of our leadership is getting continuing education all the time. So that's the way we sort of keep our talent and our skills current and relevant to what we need to do for our partners. Right. Sadiq, you work in the public sector. Your thoughts on 
talent management in the public I, sector? Um, I think um, I like what GE has started doing, and I would want um, my co-panelists also to imbibe a similar thing. The concept of developing talent through a pipeline. Um, this is going backwards right to the training schools and picking them young and mentoring them and grooming them to pass through the system. Um, not a pipeline that gets broken along the line uh, because people want to really see what's happening inside, mm -hmm. but a pipeline that we know would eventually uh, get um, output there. And um, I still like it. It forms part of maybe CSR of companies too, uh, that uh, whether or not at the end of the day, the people you bring out, you take all or you leave some for others, it still brings uh, the, 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 the competence of people. It upscales that and the capacities so that others can also take. I, I feel very um, proud today if uh, GE, for instance, trains 100 people and is only able to take 40. The remaining 60 would be available for others in similar lines. Mm. Or maybe even those people would have developed new entrepreneurial skills that they can go on their own. They can even latch on to some of the innovative things that GE is doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no point if GE does not want to recruit them. They can be service providers on their own. Um, way back on the off-grid systems that GE would eventually anyway sell the machines to. One of the frequent comments that I have heard uh, about engaging the government is that there is a skills gap, um, people aren't really, they don't understand what the private sector is trying to do. So where is the opportunity for the private sector to, if you like, help in the skill transfer, in the development of the public sector so that we can get many of these deals that we need to, to get done? From your experience across Africa, what can you tell us? Well, I think um, not to contradict what Lazarus has said, there, while there is a lot of talent, and I mean, you know, one of the good things about having a population of 170 million uh, people is that you can generally find at least one person who can do almost anything. But there is also a big skills gap yeah. in, this, uh, in this country, and I yeah. think that uh, when you look at, and I think it was even shown in one of the presentations that was done earlier, when you look at the statistics around, you know, simply how much are we spending on educating people? How many children out of school? I believe that Nigeria has the largest globally of, you know, primary age children who are out of school, something like 10 million. I think the first thing to do is that uh, corporate uh, corporate organizations and corporate Nigeria, or corporate Africa, really needs to, um, you know, advocate for education. I mean, what individual companies can do is significant and important, but really there are certain things that, you know, governments need to do. That's why we have governments in the mm -hmm. first place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of them is educating your population. The second is healthcare. Uh, which is a different discussion. So I think that, you know, part of the partnership is gently telling your partners that, look, you know, in 20 years' time, if you're not educating people, you know, we're going to have a big problem. Sure. And this is a 20-year time horizon. You know, the people we're recruiting now, it's kind of too late. You know, that was what was happening 20 years ago. Yeah. But, you know, if we want the future of this country or our countries to be bright, we need to make sure that this is done going forward. Yes, I hear you when you say that, but at the same time, we need to do deals now. So how do we bridge the gap? Because I imagine that very often you're trying to do a deal, the people in the private sector, to some extent, may not understand what you're trying to do. So how do we, maybe, maybe Charles, you, yes. you've, you've we, been all over Africa, serious, so you can tell us some. We have a very serious challenge of uh, skills, uh, of artisans for construction industry. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely acute challenge. Let me just illustrate by an anecdote. I successively visited a construction site in the, in, the, in the recent past, just last week. I went there on three different occasions with a technical person, in fact, no less than the architect supervising that site. Mm. And I went to try and gauge, uh, having been from a development background, uh, to gauge the skills, 
set and to gauge the quality of work that is being done on that site. And on the first day, the architect pointed out so many crooked walls, crooked ceilings, and uh, improperly uh, uh, run wires, etc., on the site. On the second occasion, we went back to the same site, the same problem. On the third day, the architect by this time was completely fed up mm. and said, you have to actually take down all of this. So those are not just the lacking in terms of the quality of the skills, but the time lost, the, result, the, 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 the expense, you know, we need to really address this problem. It's not just skills from the rocket science perspective, just the artisanal basic. skills, the basic skills right. to build to the, to the quality that every Nigerian is expecting at the affordable rate is a big challenge. And we need to address it now. We need to go back to the point where we're looking to build partnership with the development industry, with the developers, to really be able to invest in the training of artisans. Thankfully, that doesn't take many years to, yeah. to, to achieve. Mm -hmm. It takes perhaps a year, year and a half to get somebody to really achieve the quality levels that is required. Mm -hmm. We have to do it. There's no way we can shy from it. We understand the need for that, and we'll be prepared to provide the resources as an institution to support that kind of activity. Right. So a call to the government, and really it's not Absolutely. just to the government. I think everybody really needs Everywhere. to come together to get this to. to get this done. All right, let me now um, check on the audience. We have a question, a uh, comment from this side. Hi, um, my name is Ngu Morcho. I'm a general manager of the uh, healthcare business, and I work with, with Lazarus. A couple of things I wanted to talk when we talk about innovation, specific to healthcare, to piggyback on what Andrew said, I don't think there's, a big, there's any sector in the, in, in the economy where you can have a greater impact on life, on all the indices that, La, that Lazarus mentioned. Life expectancy, skills, employment, quality, and economic productivity, more so than healthcare. What I want to talk to, to, to the gentleman with the mortgage uh, uh, refinance companies, healthcare has two places. There's a property and there's operations. So is it, for us to be able to get more risk and more training into healthcare, would companies like yours be interested in looking at taking the risk of the property financing away from the healthcare entrepreneur so they can focus on what they can do best? So Andrew and his team can provide debt for equipment and operations that doesn't have to take the risk of the building, for example. These are some of the kinds of partnerships that we can do. See, the healthcare business is not that different from hotels, right? But we all find, you all finance hotels. So I don't understand, is there a way to reconsider how we look at risk in healthcare? Because um, people are going to come, they're going to pay for, for being sick, people are going to pay for hotels. Yeah. But we keep saying there's no industry. So I just want to throw that out as a way to redefine risk within a sector like healthcare. Right. I think Charles is throwing it directly to you, but I think it's also to everyone yeah. else here. Charles, do you yes, want to speak indeed. That up? We, we recognize the need to not just internalize the risk, but to find ways of bringing through partnership opportunities of really diversifying the risk and having a risk sharing arrangement. And so for our industry, we have brought in, as I, I alluded to earlier on, the insurance industry to really help address the issues of property insurance. We don't see why that cannot be extended to half. Uh, and so uh, we, we stand ready to support initiatives that which we think at the end of the day, if we have a healthy uh, employee staying in employment longer, the person stays in employment longer to service the mortgages that we're refinancing. So there are benefits to us. Mm -hmm. And it's, we should not mm -hmm. sort of operate in silos and say, no, that's the health sector, it doesn't concern us. We need to look at ways that we can be involved and become relevant. And in doing so, make the entire uh, synergy work better. Right. And, and so I see, I see benefits in, in not just saying, no, we're a refinance institution geared to housing. Yeah. We're a refinance institution refinancing for people. People have healthcare needs. So yes, right. we, we would. We really interesting point. Yeah. I don't think many people have thought about how healthcare could be connected to housing, but <laughs> really it interesting does. Does. how, how we does. see that connection happening. And it just shows the catalytic impact that yeah. one institution can have for the broader economy. Do we have any other comments on that point? Well, I think um, one of the things that has happened, you know, almost since uh, 
modern banking was invented by you know Renaissance uh, Venetians is really um, taking uh, a financial problem and breaking it up into its components and, and repackaging it. Yeah. And uh, that's what's really being suggested. So rather than looking at a hospital, uh, why don't you look at, uh, in fact, you could probably package it in different ways, but why don't you look at a building which you can rent, uh, you know, overnight stays, which you could, you know, look at like a hotel, uh, you know, equipment which is you know maybe rented and then you know the medical people as being service providers and then once you've disaggregated it yeah. you can then look at different ways of repackaging it or finding people who specialize in each of these disaggregated uh, bits and I, I think it's a I think it's a good idea and I think it's something that uh, should be explored. Right. Innovative solutions coming to to Nigeria I can imagine especially with the NMRC just, just tying to up say, with I, mean, I think that one of the uh, one of the most basic ways of innovating is to get different people to talk to each other. Mm, right. You know, I spend... So that's partnerships again. Yes, yes partnerships. I spend most of my time, uh, you know, talking to people in infrastructure financing. But I also try and go to conferences on IT and right. agribusiness and what have you simply to understand what's going on in mm. different sectors and to see if there are any ideas which one can borrow and bring into what we do, or any you know, nascent innovations that you know, we should be aware of. And I think it's very important, and that's why something which hasn't been mentioned in all this, diversity. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about talent, I think diversity is particularly important because mm -hmm. it brings different perspectives and different ideas. And again, that's something that we've tried uh, to, to, to do. All right, Andrew, thank you so much for that. We have another comment from the audience. My name is uh, Bola Idiaco. I work for the Nigerian Stock Exchange. My question is actually directed at uh, Lazarus. Mm -hmm. in, one, in your presentation, Elder, you talk quite extensively about uh, stuff that's been going on in the power sector. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, both the government and the private side uh, do have uh, 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 significant roles to play in terms of advancing the course. The question I have is, do you feel as though we've gone far enough, even with the recent privatization in the power sector, of actually getting government out of the way to just do regulation versus uh, still owning some of these assets? Right, so privatization as a solution. Yeah. Your thoughts on that? You know, the, the answer to the question is yes and no. Yes, in the sense that uh, if you just remember where we were, I mean, the whole sector kind of like was grinding to a halt. Okay, the enormous amount of work around the reforms, you know, the privatization and the new IPP market, you know, and all of the efforts around trying to sort of improve the efficiency of TCN and the discos. Clearly, clearly there's some effort there, but the resounding answer to your question is not enough, for sure, because we still have the same amount of uh, megawatts online, okay? And, um, and clearly, we still have a long way to go. And, and if you think about privatization, quite frankly, I mean, um, if, you, if you're following the news recently, they're now sort of making progress around the bankability of the PPA, which actually stalled the completeness or the, com uh, the completing of the transaction itself, right? We basically had a stalemate between the successful bidders and the government. The successful bidders saying, you know what? You know, the PPA that you're giving me this asset is not bankable because it's not truly cost reflective. In their mind, cost reflective about their acquisition cost. Government has a fiduciary responsibility also to protect the, the consumers and the, and the customers that um, the, the tariff is not too onerous. So there we have a stalemate. Okay, there are other conditions present in the whole transaction itself, which government is supposed to actually complete before you can transfer. For example, I mean, the transactions call for the transfer of fully functioning plants. Now, we know that some of these plants are not fully functioning. So there is responsibility, I would say shared responsibility on both sides right. in terms of getting the privatization to a state of completeness. Okay, in the new market sector, you know, there are certain things that the new government can actually just make announcements about, you know, with respect to, you know, the, the sort of risk guarantees that uh, lenders are looking for. Um, and guarantees around the supply of gas, guarantees around the transportation of gas. <clears throat> These are major issues that are not quite well understood by the general public, but you know, 
this, as you get granular into the, into the process, you know that there's still a lot of work to be done. And uh, in the interim, the Nigerians are not seeing the benefit of their, uh, a lot of the effort. But I am very optimistic. I mean, we've got to be. And we have to even stay engaged. And I think uh, just a comment that I think Andrew and, and Charles made also is in terms of bringing in new capabilities. I mean, we as a company used to play a very narrow niche in the whole process. Right from the point of view of just selling the equipment and providing some some service, now we have to extend our scope. Mm -hmm. We are also doing project development, something that we don't do anywhere else in the world, mm -hmm. but we have to develop it here, you know, because the new owners mostly are new entrants into the whole power business have no understanding of what they just bought. Right. right, the guys that are developing it have no understanding, but they're in very good positions to actually get a license. So we have to build our capability around project development. We have to provide our capability around the EPC work as well. We don't do it, but we have a network. You know, we have to work with people like Andrew in terms of financing. We bring in some of the financing as well, right? Then the commissioning, then the operations and the management. It's the entire value chain is pretty, uh, pretty intense. I mean, that's why, you know, power plants are not built overnight. And, uh, and when you build them, you're hoping that you're building them with the sort of support that you'll be able to generate power for the next 50 years. But I am very optimistic. It's a lot of work to be done, a lot of work. As an anecdote, we see comparisons in our industry. We have to really be involved in the entire value chain from development right through to securitization. And that's my comment. interesting point. So fixing Nigeria's housing sector one step at a time. Thank you so much. Um, of course. Let me just wrap this up by getting final comments from everyone. And Charles, I'll come back to you. Just your thoughts about this whole concept of innovation. We've talked a lot about talent. We've talked a lot about partnerships. Your final comments on that. Very quickly, if you can, in one minute. Innovation is the way of the future. And it begins today. And it's practical innovation. Not innovation that is rocket science, necessarily. But innovation of just making work better, the things that work. And that's what we at NMRC are setting out to do, to ensure that we have a foreclosure process that gives assurance to investors, to ensure that we have a level playing field in terms of the underwriting standards that encourage people to actually make mortgages available, to just ensure that the building quality makes sense to the person who's made to have to buy into the property and to lengthen the tenor of loans in the country. Hence, deliver housing stock, deliver affordable mortgages, and deliver on our mandate. Right. I'll be watching very closely as you do that. You. Sadiq Kazim from the Free Trade Zone. Final comment. We have the population. And the, the population, uh, the youth at that level, talents can be developed. And we have also the people who are ready. Uh, the partnerships are available. And we've seen from uh, the panelists here that there are a lot of potentials that we can leverage on to take this country forward. Andrew, the value of partnerships, talent? Yeah, I'm going to cheat and make two points. Uh, the first <laughs> point re regards innovation, uh, which is that you know innovation doesn't have to be massive. You don't have to discover nuclear fusion. Just making your processes a little bit more efficient, thinking about you know how you can attack day-to-day -day bottlenecks, all these little incremental improvements add up. The second point is around financing. Really, financing is available. I always see these things saying, you know, financing is the major bottleneck. People do not take enough time to understand what it is that the financiers are looking for and give that to them. Rather, they come with their own things and expect the financiers to, uh, to adapt to them. There's a golden rule, which is that, you know, he who has the gold makes the rules. Mm. Try and understand the rules of the financing. <laughs> Very well said, Andrew. And Lazarus? Well, so I'll say um, uh, innovation is one of the most essential DNA of, of the company. We're committed to the country. Um, we're all in here. We're going to continue to leverage the, um, the innovation of the company and, and sort of make sure that we're able to deliver for Nigeria. And Nigeria is ready for it. I think we're entering a new era. and. Um, we're just hopeful that uh, there is an understanding we can be pushing, but we need a pool as well. So we're going to sort of have to reinforce a partnership across institutions such as represented on the panel, but also with, uh, with government and uh, with other companies out there. 
All right. Thank you so much, uh, Lazarus Angbazo, the CEO of GE Nigeria, giving final comments on this very interesting topic around innovation, the value of partnerships, the value of talent. As we move into a new era in Nigeria, hopefully we'll see the impact of these two areas in Nigeria's development. Thank you so much for watching this CNBC Africa special coverage of the Innovation Barometer Forum in Lagos.